What's happening, Hardscapers? This is episode 230 of the How to Hardscape podcast, where we talk about how you can start and grow your hardscaping business. And on today's episode, we have another I Am a Hardscaper mashup episode. And in these I Am a Hardscaper episodes throughout the year, I sit down one-on-one with a hardscape business owner and do a deep dive into their business with preset questions that we ask each one of them. And uh, in these mashups, I take one of those questions and I take all of the responses from our guests throughout the year and I mash it up all into one single episode so that you can hear each of the responses for this and if any of them interest you go back into our catalog find their episode they're always titled hashtag i am a hardscaper with their name and their business right after it throughout the year and we've been doing this since our very first year so now we're on four years of doing this and lots to catch up on if you're far behind on listening to them and if you're new here thank you so much for tuning into the how to hardscape podcast and the question that we ask on today's mashup is a question i've been asking from the very beginning beginning and one I actually considered cutting almost immediately, but I just seem to get really good answers from this, though there are a lot of consistencies from hardscaper to hardscaper, especially those plugged into the Instagram community, which tend to be typically who I interview on these I Am A Hardscaper episodes. And if you have anybody to recommend to kind of break out of that, let me know. Just shoot me them at How to Hardscape on Instagram or shoot me an email contact at howtohardscape.com. But with this question, it is the question of what are some installation practices that you live by in your business or equipment that you live by in your business? Any talking points that they want to talk about there? Uh, I've been recently getting more talking about systems as well, incorporating systems into this uh, just to open the door to more office related tools such as softwares and so on for this. And at the end of this episode, actually the very last response was actually Dan from Segmental Systems. He's also involved with ICPI. And we actually asked him a slightly different question than uh, installation and equipment. I focus more so on open graded base and synthetic base. So there's a couple of questions there and a longer answer from Dan at the very end of this episode. So uh, I definitely stay to the end for this. But before we get into today's episode, we want to thank our sponsor, Cycle CPA. If you're looking for bookkeeping, accounting, CFO services, reach out to Cycle CPA at cyclecpa.com. Let them know how to hardscape sent you for $200 off their services there. And if you're looking for a software at the end of the year here to dive into throughout the winter, we've got the How to Hardscape Headquarters software. This is going to help you budget, estimate, and streamline processes in your business from time tracking, time sheets, job costing, and so much more that we've got planned for this, as well as this gives you access to our course content. So if you're looking for installation courses to help onboard and train your employees throughout the winter into the new season next year, these can help you and help you monitor their progress with the certificate of completion at the end of the installation courses to make sure that they actually did go through and complete it there. And we're going to continue to grow this course content area and a lot more community events next year for the software. So if you're looking to lock in your pricing, because as we add more features to the software, as we add more courses to our library, the pricing will increase except for new users. So you lock in your price when you sign up. So you can find out more about that at members.howtohardscape.com or send me a message on Instagram at howtohardscape if you want to book a demo with me there. And without further ado, let's get into today's episode. Hey, my name is Joel Johnson with Hatton Landscape and I am a hardscaper. Yeah, absolutely. So definitely as far as installation, we build a everything on open graded stone uh, i think most people are by now but uh, yeah that that for me was you know probably about five years ago we we switched over to only open graded but we have had very very minimal callbacks and uh, and great results um with the open graded stone for that so that um for us is has been huge um, and then as far as equipment i know uh looking back on kind of getting into the the business myself we got a a skid steer with tires to start. That was to me like the the machine. You needed a full size skid to be a landscaper, um, and I found we hardly could ever use it. Um, it just destroys people's yards um, and does a, a lot of damage. I mean, there is value in it. We do use it, um, but going back, I would say to any landscaper looking to start, the first machine I would buy is a mini skid. 
uh, like a you know MT100 or even the the bigger ditch which one. Uh, to me, those are uh, that's like step one. Uh, that thing never comes home from the projects. You know, it goes from site to site and is used every day. Uh, so for me, that uh, I know that's a pretty pretty standard tool, but that would be to anyone looking to start or grow their business. I would say that'd be the probably the first tool you look to buy. Uh, but that that has been great for us. We're we're finally gonna get a candy com this year, get our, our buggy uh, for 2023. But uh, again, we don't don't currently have that right now. We uh, just operating with the full size skid and then the the mini bobcat, you know, stand on unit. Um, so we've got the dump trucks and stuff, but yeah, so there's a, there's a lot on the wish list for us, but I know the, the next tool for sure is going to be the, the buggy. Uh, that seems like, again, that other tool that would just never come home, um, be, be used constantly. So I think those, those are the, that's the combo that, uh, any young landscaper should aspire to have. I am Alex Altshuler, the owner of Sealit Group. We specialize in ceiling and restoration and landscape construction. I am a hardscaper. Yeah, man. Honestly, the last couple of years, um, I've really been investing into the tools and equipment. Um, the one major machine I would call for hardscape, it would be, in my opinion, if you're starting out, it's it's your like it's your gold machine. It's it's going to be your real money maker is uh like a mini skid steer um so i uh i was fortunate to get um to get into the market at the end of 2020 um with uh with the bobcat mt 100 uh when the prices were still relatively okay um and you know i think i waited i ordered it in december got it in march you know and now you want to order one of those you're waiting at least a year six months to a year and the prices have gone up by like 15 grand. Um, so, but yeah, it, it's, it's probably the most versatile machine you can get starting out. It'll, it'll dig your patio. It will bring your gravel in. It'll lift your stone. It'll do whatever it has to do. Um, as an entry level machine that can do everything. I think it's probably the best machine you can get starting out. So that's been our, uh, favorite machine. And, you know, most of our guys on our crew love it because um, it's super versatile. It can do everything. Um, so that's that's one thing I swear by for, for hardscape is, you know, if you're running a hardscape business, no matter what size, uh, you know, you're going to have your larger skid steers, smaller skid steers, but every hardscape crew, small or large, needs uh, a mini skid steer. Tight access, um, you know, versatility, it's 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 the best of its kind. <clears throat> so there's the, the Bobcat MT-100. Um it's been a game changer. And also last year we ended up getting a IQ saw. So yeah. the IQ saw has been also an absolute game changer. Um, just being able to be completely dust free, you know, um, having, you know, perfect cuts, which, which you would never get. Uh, you're saving, you know, you're saving your back and the learning curve is, is, is much, much less, right? So you're able to, train new hires how to cut way easier um, than, than t you know, trying trying to teach them how to use a regular quick cut. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, like I said, obviously your, your cuts come out 100% versus maybe 70, 80. And, and that's visible on a, on, a, on a job, especially I would say where, where the IQ saw comes in the most handiest is on the porch overlay jobs where you can really see the, like a two two caps joined together on a corner or a miter cut. Those 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 are those that's where the IQ saw will be um, probably the best because it will get the cut so perfect that you, you, in some cases you won't even see the cut. That's how good it is because the joint is so good that it's like was that even cut? And then you you look close. Wow. So whereas with the you know with the quick cut you'll always, there's always that that margin of error that vibrate that you know the shaking the you know, not being completely 90. Um, so yeah, that's been huge. And even just being able to to not have dust on job sites, you know, you know how many neighbors come and complain, oh, there's dust on my car and you're blowing it off. And, you know, and then you look at actually how much dust comes out of that. Yeah. It makes you realize like you, you would have been breathing that in otherwise, right, as well. So there's the safety aspect of it, you know, 
So you're, you're saving your lungs, you're saving um, the neighborhood from dust all over people's houses and cars. You're having clean cuts. It honestly, best one of the best investments and tools I've made uh, for my business. So I'd highly recommend anybody getting started or you know growing their business. Um, get get that saw. That'll that'll change the way you look at uh, uh, getting your hardscape jobs done. Hey, my name is Alex Castelline. I am the owner operator of the Castle Landscape Group. We specialize in uh, luxury living in the outdoors, and uh, I am a father and owner of a lasagna company as well. Uh, and I am at first a hardscaper. Um, I do quite a lot of, I guess, video watching on Instagram, and everyone seems to have a different way of doing things nowadays. Um, I think my biggest pet peeve when it comes to installations are the guys switching over to doing open, like open base, open grade, um, who build on clay. And I'm not a, you know, an engineer in the, you know, soil world, but uh, whatever you call that. But, you know, to me, having something that doesn't filter water through it and then putting an open grade and not having a place for the water to drain off, uh, which is most people's applications, makes no sense to me. If you're not going to dig a deep well or put a sump pump in there, all you're doing is creating a bath underneath gravel for water to sit there and then for in the wintertime, freeze thaw cycles to go through and wreck your work. Um, you know, open base is fairly new in Canada as far as I'm concerned. I've only been seeing it for the last like two, three years. Um, I'm sure it's been done longer than that, but that's just when I started noticing it. And I'd love to see how some of these projects uh, hold up after, you know, people do this. When we did open base, we would always make sure that we had an area of the yard that we could put a weep or two uh, that ran underneath our foundation so that we could carry the water out if it did collect. I don't see people doing that. <laughs> right. So I would say that if you're going to do open base, maybe keep that into consideration that, you know, you should have a place for the water to go just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not underneath in your foundations. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent uh, point there with that. And uh, how about equipment? Anything that you've brought into your business recently or in the past or tools, hand tools, anything that's kind of made your life easier that you, that you love and stand by? I, don't know, I think the, the best tool that we'd probably ever bought was an enclosed trailer, to be honest with you. Oh, yeah. I see a lot of uh, guys, landscapers that bring their tools in the back of their trucks and they're loading and unloading every single day. And it's a huge time killer, uh, you know, I, we used to do all the work by hand, like hand shoveling out yards, wheelbarrowing in materials and stone, and it kills you. So if you're going to start a business, just invest in a loan and buy a small piece of machinery because you'll save yourself your back. Um, but yeah, the biggest game changer for us were just uh, an enclosed trailer. We bring it to site more than we do a dump trailer, to be honest, because uh, we will get materials delivered. It's the the, the MTO getting you for, you know, unsafe trailer loads or being overweight and all these other things. It's just not attention you want. So just have stuff delivered to your site, but bring a tool trailer. So you're not, you know, Oh crap, I forgot this and running back and forth from home or your shop or wherever to go get your tools. Uh, I think a tool trailer is a better tool on site than a dump trailer any day. So it's, it's like our mobile workshop. It's got everything in it. Stone saws, our gas, you know, caulking, um, string lines, everything, levels, compressors. So, um, you know, it's a mobile repair clinic too. Like we've got all our tools in there to fix our Bobcats. We've got impact wrenches to take our tires off and plug our tires if there's nails in them. So we can do everything on site through the tool trailer, which is great. So I think uh, more people need to utilize one of those. My name is Giovanni, better known as Johnny Giovanni. I'm the designer and owner of Stoneworthy and I'm a hardscaper. Yeah, it's a great question. So pretty much we have a certain standard, you know, since since we stand behind our work and, you know, obviously we give a warranty out to our clients. So whenever we do walls, you know, like retaining walls or like true retention walls, I make sure, you know, there's geo grit, you know, every few rows, you know, um, I make sure, you know, it has proper drainage, you know, the proper backfill, depending on what the application may be. When we're doing patios, all of our patios have about eight inches of gravel minimum, at least now. Before it was six, six to seven, but now it's eight. And we we throw in drive grid in there. Nice. Just to make sure, just to add that peace of mind, just because it's like nothing. I mean, in a perfect world, things settle after 10 to 15 years. And I don't know where everybody's in different places in in the world and you know at least here like in the northern side of illinois there's a lot of homes being built so you know everything settles after a while or i guess you know so i try to make sure we put geogrid i mean I, I just try to make sure we add like as much preventative maintenance as we can you know with the justifiable just 
uh, justifiable gravel base drive grid um, because it's like nothing's worse than, you know, being super busy and then getting a call from a homeowner like, hey, my patio is sinking or it's sunk here. And then it's like, you know, trying to schedule that, you know, you're going to have to pull some guys out. And then before you realize that it took a few hours, half a day, a day or however complex the situation became about. So I definitely try to over engineer things just so that if I do get a call from a client, it's because they want to add phase number two, three, four, whatever it may be. And that just, Hey, we had a problem with this. So I definitely try to, we definitely try to over engineer things as a company and we try to make sure every, every install is stone worthy. Anybody Hi, I'm uh, Scott Elam. I am the owner operator of Infinity Lawn and Landscaping, and uh, we specialize in outdoor living spaces and landscape design. Um, I am a hardscaper. Yeah, um, installation process is huge. I tell everybody, everyone that does a, a patio or, or a hardscape project with us, I, the most important part you'll never see. It, the base, the base of the project, the foundation of the project is the most important and you'll never see it. And, and there's, there's pro, like we just did one yesterday and the guys dug it. I said, Hey, this is a new house install. You know, that they excavated for that foundation. We're going to have to use our, our soil compactors, our jumpers along that foundation, go extra long on that, go five feet out, uh, pack. We take three inch stone. We pack it into that base to amend that soil. We're very clay soil. Um, we're South Chicago area. So you have a lot of clay and we, we pack in the, the, that three inch stone into that soil. If it's, if it's, um, you know, spongy, we do, we have the skid steers. I, I usually have the guys, they'll drive the skid steers over the soil before we even lay our five ounce, you know, fabric and start our base. So I know before we even start our stone base that there's uh, that the soil under it is solid. And um, with that, we use all clear, um, clear base, like a permeable base installation. It's all three quarter clear. And then three ace chip is the bedding layer. We always put a drain in there. So if water ever gets in there, it has a way to get escape. Um, driveways, we use drive grid. Um, you know, walls will use geo grid. It's just do the things right. Doing everything we do is above industry standards and it allows our, our projects to stand the test of time. And, and yes, we have a few issues that you got to go back and fix, but you go back and fix them right away. Anyone that tells you they never have is, is, you know, not telling you the truth, but um, all we have, a we have a whole process that all the guys follow on, on the installation processes and then having the right equipment. Um, you it's it's harder and harder to find good guys and the good guys want good equipment they want to know that they're you know their back's not going to hurt the next day i i was in the russo actually it's a equipment place and this was years ago i was i was renting a machine and one guy i, I ran into there and he goes why don't you just get like five or six guys and dig that patio i'm like because i could put one guy on a ditch which and I can have him dig that entire patio by lunchtime and he will be able to put in stone tomorrow. He'll be able to put in base. What, you know, he'll be able to work and he's not dead. I can put those five guys on it, spend probably more money digging that patio. It'll take me all day and they won't be, they'll be worthless tomorrow. So using equipment to save your guys to, to um, be more efficient is, is key. Um, like I said, last year, Seeing, seeing some of these guys on Instagram, like uh, Andy Mulder and, and uh, Jeremy from, from J squared. And, and, you know, some of these guys you're, you're seeing using these end cons and just equipment, just amazing what they can do. And, and we've been looking at them for a little over a year and we picked one up last year and it's, it's a game changer. It's just having the right equipment, um, doing the jobs makes it easier, more efficient and saves your guys. You could do more work with less guys. And the guys that are doing the work can work the same speed all day. They can work the same speed the next day. They're not calling you going, my back hurts. I can't come in, you know, tomorrow and, and 
you're just taking care. That's another thing, taking care of your guys with equipment. Any, any uh, new tools, equipment, uh, anything in the pipeline that you're wanting to invest into next for the guys or that they've even brought up to you? Uh, or are you fairly comfortable with where you're at and the guys are comfortable with what they have? Um, like I said, the last three, four years, we've pretty much acquired most of all the equipment we want. I do want some more like a Trimble. Um, I'm looking into that a little more computerized stuff for the excavation and installation processes. Uh, we are looking for another dump truck. We need a bigger, a bigger truck to move more material. We, we have a, a few, but I'm like, it's time to get a six wheeler or something a little bigger. Um, but that's the next thing in the pipeline. It's just a few little things here and there, but, um, and we got a couple, we got a ditch, which last year, and like I said, it's a, we got a 60 G with the NCON last year, uh, waited a long time for that. So like everything nowadays, yeah. right? Equipment, but yeah, so those, those are the big, the big ticket items. Now it's just like the little things to, to, to like the finished details on, on things. So I just want to take a break from today's episode to talk about our sponsor cycle CPA. You may have a CRM or project management software in place, but what data are you using to ensure your estimating is accurate? Having a proper accounting setup and accurate bookkeeping done is key to understanding overhead expenses and other costs that must be recouped in your estimates. Cycle CPA is a remote bookkeeping and CFO firm that helps to connect the dots from the financial reports to the hardscape and landscape data needed in order to reach high profits. They provide landscape and hardscape industry benchmarking, job costing financials by service line, advisory meetings, and much more. Cycle CPA's team of accountants are specialized within the hardscape and landscape industry, and you can visit them at cyclecpa.com and for $200 off, mention the How to Hardscape podcast. Now back to our episode. My name's Jake. I'm the owner operator of JFS Property Care, and I am a hardscaper. I am a huge advocate for the open graded base. Uh, we switched over to that, I think in 2020, we switched over. So the first year I was doing hardscapes, we were doing all dense grade because um, that's all I knew. And once I switched over, actually the first project I did the open grade was at my house and it was, it was amazing. I'll never go back. Um, way easier to compact so much easier to work with so much easier to rake out and if you have to move it again for whatever reason it's not rock hard you don't have to dig it with the excavator um really really nice stuff to use so definitely a huge advocate for the open graded base um as far as equipment goes i mean pretty much everything i have anytime i buy something new i don't know how i lived without it um honestly a huge thing for me that really opened up the doors a lot was the skid steer, the excavator, and the dump truck, which is, you know, obviously a lot of big ticket items there. But um, when I first started, I only had the excavator and that made it work for me. You know, I had that and a dump trailer and and I did a lot of work with just those two. So, you know, a lot of people, they're like, oh, I want to get, you know, what's the first thing I should buy? I know a lot of people say that they should buy a mini skid steer. Or they should buy, you know, something along those lines. But to me, honestly, I think the excavator is a lot more versatile. Um, I can do anything with an excavator you can do with a skid steer, but not necessarily the other way around. Right. Um, as far as digging footings for walls, you know, dig outs in general are so much easier. You can be so much more precise with that. Um, you know, so honestly, an excavator for me was was the first purchase and definitely what catapulted the business into, you know, into what it is now. But, you know, moving past that, getting the uh the dump truck too which was uh it's a 33,000 GBW so it is a CDL rated truck um so you do have to have at least a class B but um it, that also was huge for me because you know you can definitely stockpile material on site and have somebody offload and get all your deliveries to site you know all that kind of stuff but all that takes time so you know in the industry time is money for us and the more the more times you have to move that material the more time, you know, the less money you're making because it's taking a lot of time to move it. Even if you're stockpiling here and then picking it up again to go dump into a truck that just showed up, we take it right from the job site. And unless we're reusing it, it goes right into the truck and we don't dig normally unless we have the truck there to load into. Mm -hmm. Um, and then getting stone too. I mean, you could call your stone yard and say, Hey, I need 10 yards. 
and they're like, oh, okay, tomorrow's good. And you're like, well, no, I need it right now. Um, so being able to run your own material with that truck was absolutely huge. Um, and it made our process so, so much faster. So definitely is, and, and then we got the skid steer earlier last year and that was unbelievable that those three pieces right there is basically what made my entire business go from what it was to what it is now. And that's only, you know, been in the last couple of years. So nice. it's been, it's been huge. So definitely get as much as you can, as soon as you can. Um, and I'm not saying going into debt or anything like that. Cause I'm not promoting that. Um, I try and run as debt free as I can, but you know, obviously I wouldn't be able to grow to where I am without having, you know, a manageable amount of debt for myself. So, um, but you know, I, I work on paying that stuff off. So I'm hoping that by the end of this coming year, the only thing we're going to owe on is our skid steer at this point. So that's kind of a big goal for me. Um, I like Andy Mulder's way of going debt free, you know, obviously that's a great way to look at things. It's just hard to grow in that aspect, especially quickly. Um, so you just kind of have to weigh that, that risk, you know, on what you want to, what you want to do, but, but definitely get equipment as soon as you can for whatever you can afford. Cause it's going to save your life. <laughs> definitely. Your access on projects, are they pretty open that you can get, uh, like what, what, are, what access are you typically dealing with on your projects? Uh, it, it varies, honestly. Um, it, it really, it really depends. You know, we do work in a tight knit city sometimes, but 10 minutes out of that or 20 minutes out of that city is wide open country. So, you know, we kind of have a lot of versatility on that. Um, specifically though, actually one project we did last year, the biggest project I've ever done in my career, um, was the one we did with that outdoor kitchen, the pergola, um, you know, big, big patio, right. You know, only about 20 minutes from my house here. And, um, that was, I only got the dump truck into that backyard one time. And that was because it was a very, very rainy time. And honestly, between the house and the little bit of ledge that we were working with, that was a big hillside. There was only about nine feet. So it was just enough to squeak by one time to load it up with a whole bunch of concrete. And then everything else came from the street. So, gotcha. um, you know, we do work with tight access areas. You know, we brought a lot of material into that backyard, but you know, that's why this, the skid steer pretty much is able to fit. I mean, I've had jobs where I wish I had a mini skid for sure. Um, and that might be something in the future for me, right? Just because it's easier to maneuver, you know, you have a lot more visibility for sure. So, you know, that might be a future item for me definitely. But, um, right now we've, we've been pretty good with access, you know, we've usually been able to fit everything in. And if we can't fit machine in there, then I either rent it or, we charge accordingly, you know, yeah. and that's just kind of how we have to do it. Yeah. I asked that just because, uh, when somebody does say they prefer a mini skid steer over an excavator or vice versa, I tend to see that, uh, people with like fairly good access are going to lean more towards that excavator because they can get a bigger excavator, bigger bucket, whereas tighter access, they'll go to that mini skid steer because they've all got the fairly similar buckets. And like, for me, I'm typically around like 36 inch access if I'm, if I'm really good. Uh, so we're always mini skid steer. So it, uh, it's always interesting to get people's feedback on like, what would you start with? Would you go the mini skid steer? Would you go the excavator? Yeah. And then, and then to ask that follow-up access that typically tells you why or why not they would go with what one or the other, essentially. Uh, yeah, that, that definitely makes a lot of sense for sure. 36 inches, man. That's tight. Yeah, <laughs> that's tight it, access. Tough. Wow. <laughs> it's tough. I'm Mark Arsenault. I'm the owner of Green Monster Landscapes in Dover, New Hampshire, specializing in hardscape and stonework. And I am a hardscaper. Uh, certainly installation practices, the uh, open graded base has been uh, a big change for us that I wish I had done so long ago and there were things that i did years ago like and with open grade and like i don't know why the connection was never sort of made that like because i've always sort of done my raised patios open grade and um i remember my first walls that i ever was doing i was doing like the, the three or four feet of excavation and then filling it all with with stone and then the geogrid and the stone and then everyone was like, oh, that's stupid. Like, you shouldn't be doing that. Like, you should, you, you're, you're hauling material out that you can use for your backfill. And then you're, you're buying more stone. And it's like, and now that's, that's the standard now, you know? So it's like, 
Okay. Well, I guess I was on to something even way back then. But yeah, I mean, stone is so much easier to work with than dense gray. It just has so many advantages. It's it's crazy. So I'm I'm glad that's sort of become industry standard to some degree, I guess. It's kind of regional, I suppose, you know, whether or not you have good accessibility to uh, 57s or clean stone or whatever you want to call it. But it's made our life so much easier with open grade and just so many more benefits to it in a freeze thaw environment but like us and like like you're in as well. So, um, so yeah, from an installation side, I mean, that's one of the big ones for us. Uh, equipment wise, um, the two biggest ones for me, definitely, uh, suction equipment, um, with the amount of stone we're doing as well, you know, large scale, large format, flagging, stone steps, uh, being able to do all that with suction equipment and without straps and pry bars and all that sort of stuff has been, uh, such a great advancement in what we're doing. And then, um, yeah, we actually did this big project that we've been sort of talking about is that it's the first time, well, yeah, first time I've mach used machine suction to set pavers. So we were doing um, you know, two by three slabs with suction equipment. And I was like blown away by how fast like, we laid down seven pallets of slabs. So. Um, that's anybody I would like recommend to anybody like if you're not using suction equipment then check it out for sure and then um and then the tilt rotators are they're just amazing like it, I'm just blown away by how they've changed the way we work they have made everything so much easier uh getting away without having another machine on a job site, um, it just really changed the whole flow of how we do things now. So much, so much different, so much easier. So we have two machines now with uh, with rotators, and yeah. So last year we had one with, one without, and it got to the point where it was like no one wanted to be in the other one, you know. And then when you got in it, you're like. Oh my God, this is so stupid. I can't even spin this bucket around. Like <laughs> I, need to, I need to get the uh, I need to get my material over there, but like you're just like trying to, you know, flip it out with the bucket the old-fashioned way instead of just spinning it around and placing it exactly where you need it. It's crazy that like we we didn't jump on this technology like as North America before <laughs> now. But uh, it was almost that we threw one on a machine because we needed a we needed to spend some money for tax write off. Yeah, so and we kind of had like all new equipment, but it was just, oh, we got to spend some money or give it away to Uncle Sam. So we put one on, and here we are, like the biggest proponent of having the tilt rotator. It's an amazing, it's an amazing addition, and like it went like half the cost of the half again the cost of the machine. Or half the cost added on to it's worth every penny worth every penny yeah every yeah i would no regrets at all amazing yeah now you have two of them yeah we have two uh we have five ton and a six ton excavator in each each has the same size um i don't know what do you call it rotator so all the they're all interchangeable between the two my name is Stephen Lisk. My company is Lisk Landscape Innovations. We specialize in stormwater management and I am a hardscaper. Yeah, so I would tell you, <laughs> I wish I bought it 10 years ago, but um, it was a Jeremy from J Square. I found him probably maybe three, four years ago and I seen that he was using the Canicom buggy and I'm like, oh my God, that's a swivel buggy. How incredible is that? I got to have that. So that's been a big game changer because I think that it has eliminated wheelbarrows for most projects um super efficient you can hold maybe four or five wheelbarrows worth just in that one that's a huge purchase i would tell anybody getting in business if they can afford it and they have the money uh that's a must-have purchase 
Um, I've been wanting a tilt rotator over time. Uh, I don't know if I want to put it on the machine that I have right now, just because it's so very expensive. I think I would probably upgrade to something a little bit larger. Uh, having used one before, that looks like it could be pretty amazing and eliminate, um, you know, a lot. A, you know, you're going to get be able to get into areas that you just cannot get in with a, a typical Mini X. Uh, they're the two. They're the two that I would say. Well, at least the one purchase that I own right now, but the one potentially that I do want to own in the future. And um, that's about it. I mean, I think we mostly have everything else that we need for the jobs. I've, I remember the question I was going to ask based on lot size. You're saying smaller lots. Uh, does that mean you're dealing with tighter access projects quite often if you're going into <clears throat> the backyard? Or what does that look like for you? Oh, yeah. Our access. I wish I had you know, some of these jobs on inside, see people working with, you know, acre lots and you're able to bring in a five or six ton excavator and just rip, you know, but a lot of our stuff is small. The, the gates are, you know, 36 inch gates. I mean, we can take parts of the fence down, but uh, some, some of the equipment, the bigger stuff would be more of a hassle to be in that backyard and it wouldn't be efficient. It's a lot you know, you probably see our stuff. We got the Ditch Witch, the SK 1050. That's been a, an incredible machine the last six or seven years. Um, we bought our mini excavator back in the pandemic. That's been great. I was going back and forth about a bigger machine and a smaller machine. I think it's right in the middle. It does everything and anything. You know, if we need to excavate and do French drains and drainage, no problem. Uh, we can throw it on a trailer with our mini skid, no problem. Um, you know, if we need to do a... a a larger hardscape construction, you know, and I mean larger, I don't know, maybe a thousand square feet. And that's really not that large. It's great. Uh, you can just do everything and anything with it. Um, so our, a lot of our equipment is compact. You know, I thought about purchasing bigger, larger equipment. Honestly, we have a Caterpillar 249D and then we barely ever use it. Uh, you know, we have it to move pallets and, and, do a couple of things, but it, it sits more than anything. And we had thought about maybe getting rid of that and buying another ditch, which, which I think we're going to, uh, that's at least for our jobs. I mean, if you have wide open access, then it probably doesn't make sense, but you know, the goal is to, to minimize the manual labor, right. To be efficient, to not kill your guys out there. And, um, you know, I think that's the goal. So, Hey, I'm Shane Herbert. I'm the owner of Royal Stone and Masonry, and I am a hardscaper. So installation practice, obviously, you know, through my Instagram, I do have a lot of people reach out to me and say, why do you put it on concrete? So we do everything on concrete here on Long Island because that's, that's so much easier and accessible to us to do concrete bases. It's a quick upsell to the customers that, you know, strength, durability of the project it lasts a lot longer I, we make all our um, base like glass and then we do you know a minimal you know quarter inch of sand over that and then lay the pavers so that's some of what we do and it's some of what always been done here on the island is other contractors what do it uh, the thing is what i do love about following other people online is obviously the open grade uh, system I do love that. I would love to try that it's very soon. Uh, it's just the fact is that it is very expensive. You know, bluestone chippings out here, you know, they, you know, because Long Island is just an island. So everything has to be shipped in, you know, everything has to be, you know, trucked in. So that's the reason why it costs a lot more for, for stuff like that. But there is, um, quarries and that out there what on the island we started doing uh, three quarter chippings just out of concrete but they're not exactly like the jagged edge that uh like bluestone so that's so obviously they're a little bit more smoother so because they're smoother they're not going to be interlock into each other but I definitely want to try and do that i gotta find the right customer who you know who's going to pay the upcharge for open grade um it's something i definitely want to go into i want to be more efficient with the business we're always improving the way we lay our um our projects we're always looking to be different and improve 
Uh, equipment wise, I actually just um, I just bought a, my first um, my first machinery was an MT one uh, one hundred by Bobcat. And I feel like that was a lifesaver for digging out projects and getting in spaces around pools that are really tight next to fences. That really helped out. And then I just upgraded uh, last year to a Bobcat T66. That's improved us, you know, speed and excavating the jobs because we do everything in-house. I excavate, I demolition, you know, build the projects, grade, level. We do everything in-house. So I want to definitely improve on that too. You know, maybe eventually get into building uh, pergolas and, you know, building the whole outdoor kitchen because sometimes I do subcontract them out. Um, maybe have his own plumber on site because it takes forever to get a plumber around here. Um, but, you know, is this always improvement? I always want to improve our business all the time. What's going on, guys? My name is James Reed. I'm here from affordablepatio.com, which is our installation business, Patio SEO, which is our marketing company. And the best part is, guys, I'm a hardscaper. All right. Amazing questions. Uh, everyone I talk to and do interviews with, they, they're blown away on how fast the hour goes. Yes. One, I'm from New York, so I speak really, really fast. But I, I give a lot of info. So tools that change every job needs a skid steer on it. Obviously, depending on like if you know you only have four feet to get by, then no. But every single crew will do a little walkway. There's a skid steer there because the 20 seconds of taking it out of the machine, out of the truck versus by hand costs a lot. Loading up the dirt or the concrete in a bucket and putting it in the truck versus trying to do it by hand. So we have a skid steer on every job, a zip level, game changer. Uh, we used to use transit. We used to do all this stuff. Only reason I don't like it is it's not scalable. And the reason is you need two people or you need guys that know what they're doing. Hey, with a zip level, you go to, I could do it over the phone, go to zero. And on a 20 foot patio, I want a two inch pitch, two and a half. When it hits negative two, mark it on the pin. All right. Thank you. Uh, we do job site cameras. I might be one of like the only guys in the industry doing this stuff. We have cameras on every single one of the jobs. So we don't have to call and bother the guys to see what they're up to. So like right now I could pull up every single crew and see what they're up to. A lot of guys say, Oh, my guys are going to get mad. They don't want us to watch it. Well, then you don't run a great business. I don't need a camera to see if the guys are working. I, I know how much they should get done in a day. Like I've been doing this. We document, we job track every job. So how much we estimated material versus how much the material actually was, how long it took, how long it took, how much the dump was to the T. I don't need the cameras for that. I need the cameras because we have dri delivery people. We need to see what they're up to. Oh, they need more base. Oh, they need more brick. And I know, for, you know, from experience, calling the guys, stopping them, having them pull out their phone, having a saw going on and them just yelling because they can't hear, it wasn't efficient enough. So now we have the job, you know, job site cameras. And then we also use Slack, which is a free messaging app. And each crew communicates. So, hey, I need two more layers of brick. The driver, whoever's the closest, will say, I, I got it. And they'll go. A lot of guys with scalability, the owner gets that phone call then he has to dispatch it out. Where with Slack, it's everyone who needs to be in that conversation can dispatch themselves. So I would say those are the biggest things. And I have this all on my Instagram, all these tips and everything in that aspect. Gotcha. Yeah, I've never heard that camera thing before. Do you have any brand or typical so, camera that you use there? Yeah, it, we use Arlo it, and it's through Verizon. So okay. you got to think, it's I pay $20 a month and it has its own cell service. So it doesn't mm. need Wi-Fi. It doesn't need anything. And then we just set it up there. The guy, our guys set it up because yeah. we don't bother them. Like I, there's nothing. We're not watching them. They're not worried about it. Like, guess what? If they're sitting under the tree because it's hot, we're not like, get up. You got to work. Hey, you guys are killing it. We don't, I don't need the camera to tell me if you guys were killing it or not. Uh, so Arlo by Verizon. But I, I think every, everyone has it. But for the $20 a month, it's literally a no brainer. Hi, everyone. My name's Dan Hughes. I'm the president of Segmental Systems. I'm a hardscape contractor out of Spokane, Washington, and I am a hardscaper. One thing that I hear often, I guess, about ICPI 
is uh, the talk around open graded base, hybrid base, kind of whatever you want to call that, that three quarter inch angular crushed uh, base with the quarter inch crushed on top, how it's it's still not quite recognized by ICPI as a uh, base to install. Um, your thoughts on that, Dan? Do you use open graded base in your business? And uh, what are your thoughts around ICPI? And uh, my th- my uh, assumption is that they're still testing it and they're still wanting to see the the uh, that in the future, essentially. It, it, yeah. And, and oh, hot topic. Yeah. For me. Hot <laughs> That's topic why for I brought me. it up. I'm sorry um, to put you on the spot. So, yeah. No, no, no. I, and, and I will give my opinion yep. on it. Um, and I got an, I got I have an opinion and I have an opinion based on on facts. And I know there's a lot of people doing it. And a lot of people are going to be like, oh, you know, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, blah, blah, blah. Well, so prior to COVID hitting, um, ICPI was actually trying to do some testing. Well, even years before that, probably <clears throat> I'm going to say eight years ago or so, a mass email went out from ICPI. Um, and they're like, hey, we want to look at some some of these hybrid open graded base installations where people are using um, polysand. And, you know, nobody said, hey, Mrs. Jones, we got a bunch of engineers that want to come tear up your patio and see if what we did is going to work or not. So they didn't, you know, they didn't get any, they didn't get any, any, any response from that. And so, um, you know, they gathered some funding and uh, right now, um, you know, COVID hit, which could have damper on things for a little bit, but last year <clears throat> there's a uh, ICPI hired a contractor um, up in the Toronto area. And and they went to a paver manufacturing facility and they did, I believe it's nine parking stalls and they did them with um, open graded base chips, sand in the joints and the parking stalls are actually being used for employees. So they're simulating a real world driveway. And um, so they're not getting, they're not getting used like you would with streets with all the ESA loads and everything that goes into, uh, into um, into testing, you know, parking lots and streets. It's just, this is more of kind of replicating a, a residential driveway. And so they got it installed and they're literally, it's, they're, they're on a three month schedule to go back and monitor everything and, and see how it's going to work. Well, they got it done, um, uh, August of last year and, you know, up it, winter hit in November. So they had very little monitoring before everything froze solid. And uh, so as it thaws out, um, you know, they're going to do doing more and more testing. Um, Early indications right now are not looking very promising because you have a, you know, when you do your open graded bases, you got a 40% um, air void in there, which is a lot of space for your for your sand, your joint sand to drop into. And I know I hear guys like, well, yeah, it takes about 20% more, 25% more poly sand to do that. No, it's, you got a 40% airspace underneath there. There's a whole lot more. And so, you know, if that poly sand doesn't hydrate fully um, and, you know, to the full depth of the paver, okay, it has the ability to fall down in there, which now is going to reduce your interlock and what you have in there. The other, the other aspect to the open graded base is, um, you know, water takes the path of least resistance. Okay. So you're basically creating a swimming pool underneath your, underneath your pavers. And if you have water sitting underneath there constantly, you know, and it may not be up right touching the bottom of your pavers, but you know, a lot of guys are saying, well, we're just going to use the poly sand and then it won't fall through but your poly sand is going to constantly be hydrated from that water that's underneath. Right. And poly sand, it's hard when it dries, but when poly sand gets wet, it softens back up again. So if it softens back up, that's all the more, you know, you can keep losing stuff out of the bottom um, and middle range of your pavers without even seeing it on the surface. So, I mean, step one is if you're going to do a permeable system, do a permeable system, right? I mean, don't don't use poly sand or you need to get a drain pipe in there to get the water out so you're not you know creating a, a, a basically a swimming pool underneath your pavers um and so this is a i don't i you know 
I don't know that this is going to be the future or if there's a, you know, if there's some other things to that will take place. I mean, one of the things that's been mentioned is, okay, we do open graded base, we put down fabric, we lay the pavers on top of that, and then put poly sand in the joints, blah, blah, blah. And there's been some testing done on that. And they're finding poly sand, you know, if it doesn't, or regular joint sand, if, if it doesn't um, stay in a joint, it can actually migrate underneath the pavers. And so there's a lot. I mean, this isn't just, you know, looking at somebody's backyard. I mean, there's shape tables and, and I mean, this is pavement engineering laboratories that are doing at, at universities that are doing this type of testing. And so it's not, uh, it's not just uh, some guy in his backyard saying, yeah, I think this will work or not. So um, I'm, I'm skeptical of it. I mean, I hope it works out because it's, it'll be great. I mean, it definitely changes how things are installed, but the flip side of all that is, um, you know, I, 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 I had, uh, I got a call, you know, years ago, um, two years ago or so to, uh, to be an expert witness um, on a job site that went incredibly wrong. And, you know, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, man, if, if somebody has a problem, okay, and a problem that ends up going to court, and if you've done dense graded base C33 concrete sand, a scientific proven way of doing it, you know, you say, hey, yeah, we were doing this right. But to my knowledge and um, to the best of anybody that I've been able to talk to at ICPI, which is their engineering staff, there isn't any proven data that you could back up that says, yeah, hey, open graded bases with poly sand is going to work. And that's where you could get into a big problem, you know, in the future. So, I mean, I won't be popular with a lot of people for saying that, but, you know, cause a lot of people are going that way, but, um, I have, I have, I have my doubts. Gotcha. And thank you for answering that, uh, there. And since we're on the topic, uh, fairly quickly, uh, another type of base, which has become more and more popular is a synthetic base, something like Gator base, uh, easy base, yeah. things like that. What are your thoughts on this? As well as there for the past few years or so, there's uh easy click base, which is rated for driveways as well. Um, any, any thoughts on using that? Have you used it yourself and, and your own thoughts on this? Well, I haven't used it. I was going to use it. Um, I was actually going to try, um, um, I don't know if I want to use brand names or not, but anyway, I was going to use one of the geofoam bases, right. On, on a job. And I penciled it out and it really, you know, when they pencil it out, it's a cost savings, right? You save all this money. And when I penciled it out, I'm like, I'm not really saving anything. And so, you know, I just went ahead and, and I, cause I really, it was a, it was a backyard with limited access. And I'm like, this might be a good chance to use it. And, and it just, it didn't quite pencil out enough to where it was worth the, uh, I'm going to call it a gamble. Right. And so another one of these things is <clears throat> again, being involved in the construction committee at ICPI, there's, there's access to a lot of different information. And one of the hot topics um, that we put to bed about at the last meeting was, um, there was one of the one of the geofoam manufacturers wanted to become um, ICPI approved. Uh, they want to be an, an unapproved installation method. And we're like, great, we need 10 projects. Um, that was, that's, that's the standard requirement. We need 10 projects so we can go look at and see if they're, if they're holding up. And they failed to provide 10 projects. And I was like, okay, well, if you're not going to provide the projects, okay, um, how about this? Why don't you, you know, okay, you give me 100 square feet of it. I'll add on to my patio at home. And we'll try it out. And there was three or four guys in the committee that were willing to do that. And they weren't willing to give up, you know, they weren't willing to give away, you know, 400 square feet of, of their product um, that could actually have some, you know, some people in the committee actually sit there and, and, and test it. And so, you know, it's like, okay, we don't have the, we don't have the, the job sites to go look at. We're not getting the material. Um, I guess we're just going to put this thing to bed and say, no, we're not going to, we're not going to prove it. So I think it's more of a, a, you know, a homeowner application. I know there's some contractors that have done it. Um, and, uh, you know, I look at it as, you know, you got to go through all the work of, you still have to do some excavating. Then you got to put down sand, scrape the sand all out to lay the, the, the geofoam on and then put your pavers on top. And it's like, 
I don't see the labor savings in it so much, but you know, there might be a little bit, but is it worth it? I mean, you know, again, I'm looking at if I can have something that's, that's proven and, you know, something with documentation that backs up that this, that this system works. Do I want to, you know, go to something different? And if I have a problem, you know, nobody, the only people that went in a lawsuit is the, is, is the lawyers, right? Even if you, even if you win, even if you win, you still have all this time and money defending yourself just to say, yeah, Hey, I won. You know, so it's not worth it to me. Gotcha. I'll I'll just say I I've used uh, synthetic base quite a bit. I do enjoy it. Um, that being said, where I'm at, I'm actually in Toronto. Uh, they just uh, Ontario enforced a new rule where it's a little bit more difficult now to get rid of soil. So in those cases where uh, it's going to become in the future more and more difficult to get rid of soil, the less soil we excavate, the easier it is, as well as we're dealing with a lot of tight access. So in our situations, as well as my business model, I, I definitely see the savings, but it's definitely not for everybody. And it's, it doesn't work in every situation, kind of like what you were saying there as well. Yeah. Oh, I get rid of dirt. Yeah, I, I get rid of dirt. for Yeah, free. exactly. So it's, it's like, uh... I mean, I mean, I got getting rid of dirt is easy for me. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, that's not. You know, and, and nobody stocks the geofoam around wow. here um, in my area because nobody's nobody's gone to that yet. I mean, I got a I have a pretty good mixture of soils where I'm at. Um, you know, I can work in pure sand. I can work in clay. I can work in, um, you know, uh, cobble, round rock, cobble, you know, riverbed type situation. So um, depending on what part of town I go in, what direction I go. Uh, you know, I can I can work with all kinds of different soils. So, um, you know, we might find an application for it, um, you know. Thank you for listening to today's podcast episode. I hope you enjoyed the mashups at the end of this year here as we come to an, a close of another calendar year, at least for our seasons here. I would love a rating and review. If you're listening on Apple uh, Podcasts, you can leave a rating and a written review. If you're listening on Spotify, you can just leave a five-star rating there. That really helps the show. So I would very much appreciate either one of those or even both if you feel so generous to do so. And check out these hardscapers that gave their time to do these. I would really appreciate if you went back into the catalog. If you haven't listened to them, to go back and listen to them. Or reach out to them on their Instagram channels as well. And say hi for listening in to today's episode. And thank you to our sponsor, Cycle CPA. If you're looking for bookkeeping, accounting, CFO services, reach out to Cycle CPA at CycleCPA.com. Let them know how to hardscape sent you for money off their services there. And the How to Hardscape headquarters. If you're looking to streamline processes in your business, from budgeting, estimating, job costing, time tracking, and so much more, as well as access to our course content course library whether you want to get into hardscaping learn services for yourself learn the installation practices for yourself and also use those training resources for your employees to train them and onboard them you'll have access to those as well shoot me a message at how to hardscape to book a demo or simply go to members.howtohardscape.com to learn more about that and we look forward to meeting with you next week on the how to hardscape podcast